Uh, there are many systems in the West, especially the ones I'm familiar with, that have long called themselves democracy, but they don't mean democracy in the sense that my late partner meant of face-to-face -face democracy. It means representative democracy, sending representatives to a national capital. Um, so they're really, those are really more like republics than democracies, but they're called democracies, just, by, just generally. Um, what, is, what is happening with them? I think th these republics are under great threat now in most of the world, um, although um, I think that um, there's been the rise of right-wing forces um, 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 bringing out fear, fears of immigrants, fears of people of darker skin, uh, exploiting people's, um, bringing out racism, um, bringing out nothing happens to them. Um, many people object to this, but they have freedom to do this. Um, there's more and more attacks on black people in the United States. Um, it's, and so, so the, the racism is, is rampant. At the same time, again, I speak about the United States, the, the current corrupt, cruel, and insane president is ripping away the, the norms and the values and the institutions that, uh, that remain of the democracy in, in wealth between rich and poor. It's never been so enormous as it is now. And um, th it's, it's difficult for any kind of democracy or republic to survive with that level, that difference, economic difference. And finally, we have a lot of ignorance in the country. Um, I think th th ignorance itself is a threat to democracy. Uh, people in the United States, they take, they take their system for granted. They think they don't really need it to have a good life. Um, they, they, there's very little civic education in the schools. Many schools don't have any education in the way the government is supposed to work democratically at all. And so people aren't aware of how fragile it is and how it can be threatened. And just as I don't think, so a d democracy cannot exist with fear and, and xenophobia and racism. It can't exist, except, okay. So I, the, my first visit was in uh, December of 2014. I was invited to participate in a delegation. And it was called the academic delegation. We were here for about 10 or 12 days. I can't remember exactly. Um, but it was very early, still very early in the revolution, and the, the purpose was for us to observe, observe as, uh, to, to interview political actors and to observe as much as we could so that we could go back to our home countries and write reports about it to spread understanding of the revolution. Second visit was a year later. I was invited to participate in the New World Summit which was an, an action to create um, a kind of a, a house, a parliament for the people in Derek. It was an architectural structure. Um, and we had a, um, many international people were invited to give speeches. And I was invited to speak about my, my late partner, Murray Bookchin. Um, and we, we um, emphasized the, the, the solid, international solidarity um, and again, we made also another tour around of, of then the third visit, um, I was invited, to, I, I, I wanted very much to come back to Rojava to find out how things had changed. Um, I also had an idea since that I could write a book about, uh, that would be um, a little book about how things have changed, how the revolution has progressed in, over the years since then. And I'm an artist also, so I would make drawings that go with the book. Um, and my, the, the audience would be a general audience. I, want, I don't want to talk to just the left only. The left in, in around the world is very, very aware of Rojava and very supportive of it, but I want to help reach out to more mainstream people to educate them about this project because even, even friends of mine, you know, back, back in the United States didn't know about, and their educated friends of mine didn't know about Rojava until I told them about it. So I think there's, there's a lot of ignorance. So, and at the same time, a film crew was interested in many changes. Uh, see, the most, most obviously, the pollution is very, very bad. Um, and the roads are worse. And yeah, it's, it's, it's in the large cities, the, the pollution is terrible. And there seems to be more traffic. So that's the first, the first, the first difference I notice. Um, 
the second difference is I, th I um, is the difference in the in the in the the governmental system. I'm very interested in the democracy, in the structure of the democracy here, because that's what Murray Bookchin was most interested in. And so he wrote about a face-to-face um, -face democracy with bottom-up powers. And so that was, um, and, and, and insofar as he had some degree of influence on Abdul Ujalan, who also talked about democratic confederalism, using some of Murray's ideas, using other ideas. Uh, I was interested in seeing how much it's possible to create this revolutionary system of bottom-up democratic self-governance. And, you know, even in 2014, it wasn't simply that that existed in the communes and the councils and at the different levels, but you also have the, the self-administration. Um, back, back in 2014, each canton, Jisre, uh, Kobani, and Afrin each had its own uh, democratic self-administration with, with a more, that was a more like a conventional government with a legislate, legislative council and an executive council and so on. And now I understand that um, based as of last autumn, the autumn of 2018, there's a new social contract and these, they're the, it's not three cantons anymore, it's I think eight regions and they've converged to form a federal government that's much more uh, but I understand that this is also due to, due to causes of war. I'm not, I'm not making judgments about this. I'm just making observations. The communes and councils still exist, and I'm looking forward to going to visit some, especially some commune meetings. Uh, my project is to write a, a book, um, just sort of like a, a journal, a, like a travel journal of this, of this trip, talking about the different places we went and the people we talked to and what my observations and impressions are and make drawings, as many as I can. I want it to be illustrated because people like drawings. <laughs> they like pictures. So that's part of, I, as I said, I, I, I want the book to reach mainstream people, not simply the left. In fact, I want, the, I, and the drawings are part of a, are a way of attracting attention to the book um, from mainstream people. So the third revolution is a reference to a book that Murray a four-volume book that Murray Bookchin wrote. Uh, it was his last book, at the end of his life. It's been translated into Turkish. Maybe you've read it. Um, it's a it's a history of popular movements in mainly European and American revolutions. It, it, um, the third revolution is a phrase that came it, that Murray Murray was a, a student of history, he, and he noticed that at one point during the French Revolution and at one point during the Russian Revolution, the sequence, the first revolution is the revolution of the bourgeoisie, like the, the, the revolution of 1789 in France when the, the middle class wants to have more power in relation to the, to the monarchy. Okay? The second revolution is the revolution of the, of the left, of the hierarchical left, of the, of the tyrannical left that wants to overthrow the bourgeoisie like Marxism, overthrow it, but they themselves are very dominating, they're very top-down, very authoritarian and even feeding into systems of totalitarianism in the 20th century. The third revolution is the revolution of the people against the top-down second revolution. It's saying, we don't want you guys just to replace the old system. We want to have a new revolution that's a revolution of all the people together equally. thought of saying, and we will make a women's revolution. I think the Rojava revolution is the fourth revolution. As what do women around the world think of the YPJ? Uh, both of those who know about them um, probably are just as impressed as I am. Um, um, and I, 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 I don't know what, what more to say beyond that. I, um, many, have, many are not all that aware of them, but those who are, I think we salute you and we thank you for, for doing this job of defeating Dash. Um, um, and, and more power to you and may you, may you continue, to, co continue to, to expand your force and go on to work against maybe some even greater threats that are even other threats that are in the region now. Nice northeast Syria. I wish my country would would provide would provide and, and because if the United States would recognize it then other countries would recognize it as well because we are still for some even with President Crazy we're still regarded as a leader. So 
Um, I wish there were more than, more than 200 people here, 200 forces here, or 400 with their two forces divided, um, but at least it's a symbolic presence. Um, the threats of other countries, I think Turkey, I, I agree with um, Sali Muslim, that Turkey is, that Erdogan is kurdophobic. I think that he, he has an irrational fear of the Kurdish people. I, we, we drove along and saw this wall that he put up for no apparent, no apparent reason. There's no threat from the Kurdish people to Turkey. On the contrary, Kurdish people want to live in, live in peace with the Turks. And, and um, so that's, it's, just, it's just madness. I think, he's a, I think he's a demagogue. I think he is a, a dictator too. And once again, whips up fear, whips up fear. Um, against imagined, imagined outsiders who, who pose imaginary threats. It's a very, fear is a very useful tool for dictators. Um, and if there's no real threat, they make one up. So um, as for other threats in the region, uh, the Assad regime, uh, I understand that he only has the support of 5% of the population now, I've been told, and, and even the Alawites are turning against him. Um, does he have a, a, a force? to, to, to re retake uh, uh, Rojava, I doubt it. There's, I don't, the, Russia, the role of Russia seems very murky to me. Um, the role of Saudi Arabia, you know, all these players want to want to reshape the situation in their own way. I would like to see Syria become a democratic nation, the way Ojalan described. I'd like to see the Northeast, the, the, north, uh, the Northeast Syria continue as it is. I'd like to see its model expand. I'd like to see um, expand into the rest of Syria. I'd like to see Assad go away, and I'd like to see, um, yeah, I'd like to see that that dem democratic nation come into existence. Um, this Mr. Jeffries, who is here now, and he's proposing. I think he's too. He is also too huh, too much listening to Erdogan, even though I'm told he's also very very uh, aware of Rojava and very smart. But he now there's talk of a. Uh, of, of a, a, secure, a safety zone with a security force that includes Turkish troops, and I think this is very, very dangerous. Well, I think Abdullah Öcalan is the chosen, is the representative of, of Kurdish aspirations to freedom that, has, that the Kurdish people themselves have chosen. They have chosen him. And whatever Turkey imagines that he might have done, he is the legitimate voice and representative of the aspirations of the Kurdish people for peace and freedom. I think he is the only true negotiating partner with Turkey for peace in peace talks. I think the peace talks. I think he should be released. I think his his imprisonment is is torture. Um, I think his human rights have been violated. When I was when I visited Istanbul, I found out his lawyers have tried to visit him many many times. Every week they they make a request to go visit him. They haven't seen him since maybe 2011 or something like that. It's been so long. This in itself is a violation of human rights. It's, and it's torture. So he needs to be released right away, and peace, peace discussions with, with Turkey, the Turkish government, need to be, need to be resumed for a, for a solution to this just terrible. I think people want to live in peace. I think we've got, I think people in Turkey are getting tired of Erdogan and his fear. I think they're beginning to see through his demagoguery, and they want to live, want to live together in peace with other peoples, the way people live in Rojava, in brotherhood and sisterhood. So Leila Guven and others are now striking, not, not for even for his release, just for an improvement in his conditions. And this seems, this seems very basic. Um, and um, many people are now in solidarity, and I strongly support their goals of, of improving conditions for him. And of course, as I said, I would go further and, 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 and want, want him to be freed after 20 years. He's now, it's now been 20 years. That of course, of course, Afrin must be liberated. Um, I hope that, and I hope that this is possible. We have this. I understand that it's being turned into the equivalent of a Islamic State caliphate, like Islamic State. They enslave women have been enslaved, um, put into sex slavery. Men have been massacred. Ch um, there's been an ethnic cleansing. There's been a demographic transition, trans uh, a, a demographic change. Um, three hundred. I understand that three hundred fifty thousand Kurds left and 350,000 Arabs brought in to live in their homes. It seems like a continuation of the project of Arabization, the Arabization of Kurdish lands, this time in, in Afrin, a place with a mountain called Kurd Dag, a place where Kurds have lived forever. Um, it's, it's cruel, 
ago when I was here before. I feel like there's a um, um, the, the, the solidarity amongst the peoples, the, the, between the Kurds, the Kurds and the Arabs and the Chechens and the Syriacs and the Turkmens and you know the, all the all the different the is the is is the the Muslims and the Christians, all the different and the Yazidis, all the different components. The fact that you have solidarity makes you strong. It makes it impossible for any country ever to come in and really conquer. Even even I believe Turkey. I think the the, the power of your of the, uh, the solidarity amongst you is a, is a strong force in its own right. Um, I also feel like there's a confidence that people here, I visited Roja, Rojava University, you know, where originally the, uh, there, there's, there's uh, there training professionals in, in agricultural engineering and in, in petrochemical engineering and in finance and management and and all these things, these, this professionalism, the courses have extended now to four years. It's a promise for the future. It's a beacon for the future. It's saying, we believe we are going to continue to exist and thrive, and we're going to um, educate people. If it takes four years, that's fine. We'll educate professionals so that they can help us to make this a, um, a, a more secure and more prosperous society.